Um, so why did we start NeurotechX in the first place? So I think we, we will, you will all agree with me that we live in an amazing time in history. Our relationship between brain and technology is unlocking different uh, new exciting opportunities and potential, but it's not without uh, consequences and ethical concerns. So with NeurotechX, we strive to facilitate the, uh, and accelerate the development of neurotechnology with a bottom-up approach. I'm not gonna go with the usual NeurotechX spiel. I think that you all have uh, heard that before, consumed the material uh, and seen all the presentation and gave these presentation yourself. So uh, I'm definitely more addressing uh, you as volunteers and people involved in NeurotechX. Um, just reminding a little bit why we're doing this in the first place, how we're doing it, and what exactly we're doing. So, as you all know, what we do is that we bring neurotech enthusiasts and experts together to provide resources to create an inclusive and collaborative ecosystem, driving innovation at a local and international scale. So, as you all know, the three main pillars of NeurotechX are community, education, and innovation. So, the thesis behind NeurotechX is that we, if we bring people together, provide resources, then they can go on and have an impact on the field. So that's really uh, what, we're, uh, what we're after. And the way that we're doing it is through several initiatives. Um, so in a nutshell, we nurture an online community of thousands of members. We organize physical and online events of various sizes. Uh, we provide educational resources, engage and provoke discussions with the public, experts, enthusiasts, curious people, the full spectrum. We keep people informed about the evolution of the field. We help industry and academia find the talent they are looking for, and so much more. Um, okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Hall. It's my honor and pleasure to, to introduce this new initiative, this new neurotechics initiative. Um, so my name is Romain. I will be your host for today. I'm a neurotechics administrator and uh, the founder of uh, Neurotechics Paris chapter. Um, and as you probably guessed from my uh, terrible accent, I'm a French. Um, so I will introduce a, uh, for a, a bit the, this uh, new event and new initiative. Uh, first of all, with a, a short presentation of neurotechics on the goal of this event, and then I will give the floor to to our panelists uh, today. Uh, about Neurotechics, so Neurotechics is a, an international nonprofit organization. It's based in um, Canada, in Montreal. The goal is to, to, to bring to have a community to, to gather all the enthusiasts who are seeking to, uh, to, to see the advancement of neurotechnology. And uh, this initiative started uh, in the summer of 2015, so more than five years now. And we try to promote the culture of makers, of open source, open hardware, open, open science, and so on. We have three pillars. Uh, one is uh, based on the community, so we are kind of a connector uh, to help people uh, from student to, to expert, to entrepreneur, to, to many enthusiastic people around the neural technology. We also have a, 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 big, um, a big aspect to push some education content and to, to push uh, accessible resources, learning opportunities, and, uh, and give the opportunity to, to beginner to, to start in neuroscience and neurotechnology. And then we also have uh, a big uh, part on the innovation part. We have a, a service called Neurotechic Services to help a company to, to structure um, the, the, need, the, the need they wanted to address uh, through the Neurotechic uh, and Neurotechnology uh, Network. So we, we are a global uh, and international community. We have what we call chapter. It's like local community uh, associated to a specific city all around the world uh, now. We have uh, a Slack with thousands of people uh, with a lot of curation of uh, help between each other and so on. <clears throat> uh, you can uh, join us on Slack uh, via the neurotechics.com website. 
Neurotechix promotes a lot of initiative from uh, local uh, uh, chapter or um, global initiative. So we also organize a lot of events such as this one, uh, like the Neurotechix gaming uh, challenges. We host uh, uh, what we call a buzzing review, and uh, we have student club competition all across the, the world. Uh, in complement each city chapter, it's very, is uh, free to organize their own local gathering. And for example, in Paris and San Francisco, we host uh, based on the weekly uh, um, uh, basis. We have what we call Act Night Gathering, and uh, you can also follow. Uh, stay tuned about the, the news on Neurotechix via our newsletter. A uh, quick uh, zoom on the buzzing review. Uh, we do that uh, since three years now. The goal is to propose you a creation of all the, the news about new technology, funding, innovation, regulatory update, and so on. And we uh, try to push uh, this content to our local chapter uh, and to have a, a local gathering as well. And uh, it was our third edition uh, a few weeks ago across uh, multiple chapters. And here an overview of uh, the main initiative we, are, we have currently. So we are st student club, uh, especially in uh, Canada, US, and more and more in Europe. Uh, we have a content lab. It's now a, a medium uh, to, to follow some uh, very deep articles on neurotechnology. We have a, a platform, uh, an educational platform called Neurotech uh, EDU. Uh, we have a book since a few months uh, available uh, on Amazon. Uh, and uh, we have a local uh, event initiative on local series like the Neurotech Design by, by Barcelona and uh, a lot of other initiatives. So we celebrate our five years anniversary. It's almost maybe uh, almost two, two years from now. And uh, yeah, to, to uh, introduce a bit of context about the XR Biosense event. So the momentum of this event is uh, we, we saw and we listen a lot of uh, growing its interest uh, across uh, the community uh, from for immersive technologies and we, we see a lot of advancement in, uh, in hardware and software and in research in uh, outside the lab and, and so on and uh, we saw also the arrival of a big initiative like the Galera project by uh, OpenBCI and we, we decided to try to de decipher and to try to have a, a discussion about uh, this uh, convergence between neurotechnology and immersive technologies. So here's some, an overview of some material we have now on the market from uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, haptic uh, gloves, uh, haptic combination and EEG devices and so on. And we also have a lot of discussion about uh, privacy, the ethical impact of all this new discussion and new challenge uh, in our ground. So it's a, it's a big momentum for us and uh, we see that as an opportunity to, to launch this event today. Uh, aim to, to, to showcase this, uh, these challenges and this potential on three, uh, between neurotex and also all type of biosensor like eye tracking or, or ECG and, and so on with immersive technologies. And we try to always to have this, this look as a community of the goal to highlight uh, open initiative and artistic project also to invite us to take a, a step aside and to, to have a kind of a critical look on, on this. And, um, and here, uh, I, we have also uh, uh, a core team behind this event. So we prepare this for, uh, for a few months now. We have like a, a lot of issues to, to manage. We postpone uh, multiple uh, 
time, on, but uh, we are live now, and we are very happy to that. Um, and the goal of like the program of this event is to uh, present you an overview with uh, multiple formats. So we will have a, a keynote in a few minutes, and then a round table uh, with three people. And then at the end of this uh, evening or day, uh, according on where you are based, uh, we have a, we will host a French panel, so it will be in French. And then tomorrow we will host a technical lecture, three technical lectures. And then we will have um, what we call a, a neurobar. So it's a place, a informal uh, way to, to discuss with the panelists and the experts and, and everyone together to, to ask questions, to, to share news and so on. And to, to continue on this um, uh, initiative, we want, we want to, to push forward this, uh, uh, this energy and on this momentum by exploring a new, new format with maybe a workshop, uh, live demo, uh, maybe some performances, try, try new material and so on during uh, later this year. So if you are interesting, you are very welcome to, to join us. And for today and tomorrow, here I'm very pleased to, to introduce you our panelists. And I'm, I'm very honored to have them uh, here with me uh, today and tomorrow. And uh, just to have an overview of the program. Uh, so uh, as I said, we will start uh, with the keynote in a few minutes or seconds from now. And, uh, and then the round table. And uh, feel free to join us um, on the other part of the days and, uh, and ask questions. And uh, maybe also, in, I know that we are an international community and it's an international event. Feel free to just write in a chat uh, where are we based to just to have an overview of, uh, of the variety of people uh, we have here today. And uh, without further ado, I will uh, just I will pass the floor to, uh, to Elena uh, for the, the first keynote, the opening keynote of this new event. Elena, so the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you, I hope you can hear me. Yeah? Yes. So I will, I will start sharing my screen. Just one second, share screen. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for, uh, Roma. Thank you for inviting me to, uh, be or give this keynote. I'm never sure how keynote. What is it? A person who is a keynote, or I'm giving a keynote. But anyways, I'm I'm really grateful for this uh, opportunity to share my knowledge. Uh, I am so yeah. My name is Yelena Mladenovic. I am uh, currently a professor at uh, Computer Science Faculty and Union University in Belgrade, Serbia. And also recently, I founded uh, NTX Belgrade, and we're really excited to be a part of the NTX community, to share our knowledge and start organizing hackathons and all of these different um, events. Uh, so, uh, wait, I'm just gonna put uh, this aside, okay. Uh, so today I'll talk about something that uh, the topic is a bit more maybe philosophical than I am used to, but I think uh, you might like it. It's going to be a bit interactive. Uh, so, uh, I will talk about, um, as humans, where do we stand in Biosense and XR technology? Okay, so I would like you to imagine yourself standing here, surrounded by a forest and mountains. You can smell the, se the, the scent of pine trees. You can hear the river stream. You can feel the, the wind on your skin. And you realize that you know, the reality is full of sensory information and all of your senses are, are involved. But when you look at this picture on the screen, your senses uh, are reduced and this experience is reduced to mostly visual and auditory feedback. So what is you know the recent 
tendency, well, recent for the past decades, is to use XR to add and or modify the sensory information. So let's do a test. Okay, so I'm gonna present this image and I'm asking you what kind of reaction do you have when you see this image? You can just think about it, you don't need to answer on the chat. And what about this image? So maybe this image provoked a more, maybe you noticed that you, you maybe swallowed because you have increased saliva secretion or increased gut contractions, especially if you're hungry or if you really like pizza like I do. Um, so you realize that with a more realistic uh, sensory information, you have, or you're maybe more aware of this physiological or body reaction to an image, to uh, sensory information. Okay. What about this image? So what do you think? What kind of reaction? What, what do you feel? Um, well, I can tell you, usually uh, it's more cognitive. And uh, this hammer, because of your experience, your previous experience and knowledge, what to do with the hammer, uh, your brain will kind of tell you uh, all of the actions to be performed on this hammer, on this manipulable object. This is known as a perceptual affordance, perceptual, sorry, affordance that was introduced by Gibson a while ago. And it basically uh, implies that just by perceiving an object, uh, you, you, your brain kind of creates all of these possible uh, functionalities or actions that you can take on this object. And especially, so, especially if you're right-handed, because of the orientation of this hammer, you will have a more, let's say, faster or uh, faster response. So basically your brain is preparing you to be as, you know, as effective as possible and react as fast as, fo as possible. So you have neural responses immediately in your motor cortex in order to be more efficient. Now, when if this um, hammer is presented within a personal space, now this can be tested in virtual reality, for example, not really on the screen, but let's imagine that it's in your personal space, you will have higher motor potentials than if it's further away. Now, what about you know, the position of the object in space? If you can see this circle, it's in the central uh, vision of your vision, central part of the vision, and, um, and versus the rectangle that is on the right, uh, right bottom corner, you start feeling, adding some emotional content to this, right? Because what is in the center, it feels more easy to look at and it feels maybe more important and more pleasant versus this rectangle that is, you know, you need to add more effort, you're moving your eyes onto the right bottom corner. So it feels tiring, feels maybe it's just not really important because it's not in your central vision. So we tend to add emotional content when we observe or perceive some information objects. So for example, here you can see that this circle is on the left and it feels insignificant while this rectangle feels imposing or intimidating even or disturbing. Now this is you know common in literature it's very known let's say that you know we react to different colors differently to different shapes and sizes or movement. So for example if you look at this line here I think you can see my my mouse here moving. Yeah, so if you see this line, uh, you can imagine movement and it feels exciting uh, while versus this line that is more smooth, it feels more calm, right? So we tend to add emotional content to more angular, when, it, when the objects are more angular uh, and sharp, they feel more harsh or stiff while round objects and smooth feel more calm feel more calm and pleasing okay so whenever we react emotionally actually the physiological response is happens at the same time 
but we'll talk about what happens first later. Um, so you maybe the notice that you had some increase in heart rate, respiration rate, that you maybe sweat just a little bit more, your pupils dilated, you had some micro facial movement expressions and gut contractions and so on. And maybe you didn't notice that because it's governed by the autonomic nervous system. Basically, it's something that we're not really conscious of, but it happens automatically. And we can divide it with sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, autonomic nervous system, which basically you can simplify it with uh, sympathetic is something that governs uh, more excitative uh, information while, while parasympathetic is something that is more calm, that we feel something more calm and, and relaxing. Now, I would like to take a moment to talk about the experience of emotion. And the very known theory is called the James Lang theory. Now, I will, I will read uh, a quote. So without the bodily states following on the perception, the latter would be purely cognitive in form pale, colorless, destitute of emotional warmth. We might then see the bear and judge it best to run, receive the insult and deem it right to strike, but we would not actually feel afraid or angry. Now, this was a really long time ago. James theory was in 1994. So you can imagine how much this theory changed in, within a century and it was updated. There was a lot of controversy and talk, talk and studies about that tried to you know, prove it or disprove it and so on. But I will just talk about two updated theories that are maybe most known. The first one is a two-factor theory that basically says that, well, you need both physiological response and cognition together in order for the person to experience emotion. And maybe you've heard about Damasio. Damasio is very known if you were ever reading something about effective computing and if you were interested in emotion, Damasio is like a very known name and researcher that researched about that. And his research relied on the James theory mostly. And he added this so-called somatic markers in decision making, which basically mean that you will base your decision according to uh, your basically your bodily reaction that memorized some, uh, some previous or past experience that you have. Let me explain, you have an image here. Let me, it will be more simple. So if you hear a growling dog, this will, uh, you know, your autonomic, uh, autonomic nervous system will react, the salamis will send the information or the instruction, will, have the increased heart rate, sweat, whatever, a lot of, you know, physiological arousal and response. And then this visceral information will go back to the brain and the brain will label it cognitively and you will be more conscious about, oh, that's scary. But with Damasio, so depending on the previous experience you had before with dogs, Maybe you won't be so afraid because you had some pleasant experience and you, instead of running away from the dog and being so fearful, you might have the need to, you might decide instead of running, right, to maybe pet the dog, calm it or give it some food or something. So it depends on your previous experience. Okay. So I would like to mention a few experimental studies that show that when we modulate physiology, that can alter our uh, perception of emotion or experience of emotion. So maybe you can try and smile, like while watching this presentation, you can smile and see whether or not you maybe feel something positive, like a positive affect, or you know, maybe just slightly happier feeling. So it will show that you know when you smile, that you might feel happier. It's very interesting, this phenomenon, I think it's fascinating. Uh, but at the same time also, if you frown or make uh, facial expressions that are you know, negative or, or, or angry, you also might have the tendency to feel a negative effect. Now in the second study, which is interesting, uh, Botox was injected in participants' faces. So that was reducing their ability to express, you know, to make facial expressions. So uh, because of this, uh, they were told, sorry, they were also told that they need to uh, imitate angry 
facial expressions. And because they were unable to do that, actually what happened is that, you know, they checked with an fMRI, they realized that the brain region that processes the emotion was also inhibited. So basically they were not able to feel as angry because they were not able to, to express the angry expressions with their face. That's fascinating. And the third example is also the participants were uh, injected with a drug that was increasing, that increases their arousal, heart rate, sweat, breathing rate, and so on. And so uh, the experiment was like this. Uh, there was this, they thought there was a kind of a random guy, okay? And this random guy would act angry or happy. And one group of the participants was told that there could be some side effect from the drug. So they knew they had a drug and there was a side effect that they could feel more aroused. So they knew that the side effect of the drug, you know, increased their heart rate and so on. And the other ones didn't know about the side effect. And what is very interesting is that the other group who didn't know about that, they were more easily influenced by the emotions of the guy who was expressing the angry or happy emotions. So they felt like they were more likely to be susceptible to the emotions of the influencer, let's call him, while the other ones who were aware of the side effect of the drug, they weren't uh, so influenced by this guy. So they, they, they kept it a little bit, let's say, more neutral. So the knowledge about these uh, physiological responses and the side effects of the drug influenced their, their uh, uh, let's say, uh, feeling or of emotion and intensity of this emotion. Sorry, I, I'm talking too much about this experience, but I'm just fascinated about this. Okay, so what we can conclude is that being in control or aware of our physiology or being aware of this effect of stimuli like this drug, we could more easily understand our emotional and cognitive states and also maybe modulate them more easily. So this on this principle relies biofeedback. You probably know about this technology, right? So we have some physiological processes and we measure them with different, you know, measuring instruments here, like with PPG that's embedded in a smartwatch or breathing uh, belt and so on. And basically this information, these signals are mapped onto some kind of modality. Now it can be an XR, VR, just simply on sound or light and so on. And the fact that we are externalizing our internal processes can help us understand the physiology and possibly the emotion that follows. And then we can try to modulate or, um, yeah, modulate and regulate our emotion or cognitive states. It depends. Now, why cognitive states? When If we add neural information and EEG, for example, as a measuring instrument, we call this neurofeedback. So we're externalizing neural information uh, to the user, back to the user. We're presenting it through feedback and um, through different modalities. And um, mostly with neurofeedback, there is a it's difficult to measure really emotion like arousal and what I mentioned earlier, like balance, anger, or happiness, because the processes, the areas of the brain that process emotion are deep in the brain, situated deep inside the brain. So we can't really assess that with an EEG. But what we can assess with an EEG is often something like you know, attention, we can do that. We can do mental workload and motor imagery and things like that. So something we can assess with some EEG, more cognitive, let's say, uh, reactions uh, to the, to the stim some stimuli. Now, what are the uses of physiological data in human computer interaction? So as I mentioned, we can infer user experience or in this example, cognitive workload with EEG. Or we can, for example, infer emotion with EGG. Now, this is maybe something new to you. Not uh, it's it's a bit of new discipline or a new field of research. Electrogastrography basically is placing also electrodes, but on the gut, 
And as we realize that gut can also serve as a biomarker of emotion, of disgust, for example, or stress and so on. So basically it would tend to contract your, your, your gut, let's say, or I'm not gonna get into detail, but contract your gut um, more when you're stressed or, or uh, uh, disgusted and so on. So what are the other uh, uh, uses of physiological data? For example, yeah, we can provide biofeedback through uh, spatial augmented reality and virtual reality for well-being. We can use tangible interfaces for, uh, to foster human connectedness. We can, of course, you brain, use brain-computer interfaces. That is, I think you're, you, know, you know about what that is, how this technology works. And as opposed to brain computer interfaces where a user is controlling a machine or a device with only neural activity, a neuroadaptive technology actually often tends to adapt uh, to users' physiology, but without the user consciously controlling the environment with the physiology. Basically, the physiology would adapt without the user knowing. It depends on knowing, but being cautious of conscious of his own uh, uh, physiological responses. So basically, here there is an adaptive environment, according to the physiology. Uh, and of course, we can, for example, use wearables. It's the most easy way to, you know, measure physiological data. And in this example, I really like this example that we can actually think about enhanced communication between people where we can send breathing patterns, breathing, our breathing to another. So we can communicate through breathing. And the other one will receive our breathing, for example, through, again, different modalities, vibration, uh, sound or light, and interpret it as an emotion of the other. So it's, it's a different way of communicating. I will uh, focus on brain computer interface because it's my field of you know, expertise. Uh, so, and also I think it's the most complex, um, complex uh, system, let's say. It's, uh, it works, uh, it needs a lot of work to do in order to, to we need a lot of improvement, let's say, to, to do. I think so, you know what it is, brain computer interface. So basically we are, we are uh, manipulating uh, a device using only neural activity. The application is vast uh, in medicine. So, you know, we can manipulate a wheelchair, a robotic arm, um, an object on the screen, for example, by imagining left or right hand movement, we can move this object left or on the right, whatever. So this system is a closed loop system and it reacts uh, to the user in real time. A closed loop means that basically whatever the user, uh, let's say thinks, uh, it influences the success of the machine and then the user reacts to the outcome of the machine and then it produces a new physiological and neural responses. And then, you know, it would again necessitate the per person to focus again, to control the machine. And so it, it goes, you know, it's, it's a loop. So, but what happens is that, as I mentioned in the beginning, we react to, you know, content uh, emotionally, or, you know, it, our, our cognitive states change in time. And so it's a little bit difficult to just focus to control the machine all the time. This means that for in this example, we all the time need to think only about imagining left and right hand movement to control the machine. So we just need to think about that. If we have wandering thoughts, the machine, you know, is not going to work as well. So it's very interesting how the system really depends directly on the focus of the user. So what often happens is that it's really difficult to focus and to just think one command control the, to control the machine. And often what happens in motor imagery for in computer interfaces is that there's you know, often poor performance. And it's not just because of you know, difficulty of, to focus, it's just imagine, if you need to control a machine or this object on the screen uh, by imagining your left and right hand movement, it's so strange. It's not something that we're familiar with. 
So we need to learn to control the machine. We need to learn to train, to be able to, you know, to kind of have that as a more automatic response and reaction, something that, is, that feels more natural, more spontaneous without thinking too much about it, right? So we need to learn. And, you know, to help users learn or train, um, in BCI community, we were thinking about a lot of psychological theories. So in the beginning, you know, I, I think you know about these behavioral theories that rely on extrinsic motivation, meaning that, for example, you know, a desirable behavior will be uh, awarded with some something, let's say money or whatever. So we will be, have an extrinsic reward. And on the other hand, an undesirable behavior will, you know, have a you will receive some kind of a negative feedback or I don't know, someone will take your money. Or, I don't know, I'm just giving some ideas here. So in BCI, there were these uses and implementations of the, these theories, but you know, it didn't really seem to work well enough. Then other uh, psychological theories came into question. Uh, cognitive developmental, developmental theories, for example, that rely on intrinsic motivation. So what does it mean intrinsic motivation? So basically that the action or the task itself uh, evokes a, a pleasurable experience. So basically, maybe you've heard about the zone of proximal development or the ZPD. And it, the, the idea was that basically Vygotsky thought that, you know, there is a teacher and this teacher will adapt the content to his student and this adaptation of the content or task difficulty you know will will adapt according to the skills of the user and it will feel more uh, the task will feel more intrinsically motivated because well the student just believes it's he is confident in his, himself he believes that he can actually achieve and accomplish this task so in bci for example there was this use of gradual um, addition of task difficulty I say, or gradual task difficulty by adding a dimension of control. So first in, two, in 1D, 2D, and 3D, and that would add it difficulty. Um, then let's go, uh, let's go further on with motivational theories, with instructional design theories. And I mean, there are a lot of theories, but these guys saw that maybe using extrinsic and intrinsic motivation can be useful and so on. So I'm not going to talk too much about all of this. So let's go back to the, uh, the, the BCI yeah? again. So we realized that what is beneficial, beneficial user states for BCI, meaning that people uh, would have higher performances when they were highly motivated, when they were immersed, immersed into the task, when they had high cognitive control, they would have higher performances. So that's interesting. Okay. And when we think about all of these beneficial user states, the, composite, the composition of these states actually um, together form one composite state, let's say, called the flow state. Now, uh, the founder of the flow theory called Csikszentmihalyi, I would like to maybe quote, share with you some quotes that I really like. So he says that it is when we act freely for the sake of the action itself, rather than for ulterior motives, that we learn to become more than what we were. The self expands through the act of self-forgetfulness. So this can maybe be evoked through immersive and playful environment, or, you know, XR, VR. Enjoyment appears at the boundary between boredom and anxiety, when the challenges are just balanced with the person's capacity to act. So maybe if you heard about flow theory, you might have seen this kind of model where basically it says that if a task is too difficult, you might feel frustrated or anxious, or if it's too easy, you might feel just bored. So in between is like the optimal uh, uh, content, let's say, or uh, adapted task difficulty for you to, in order to feel flow. There is one more state I would like to mention um, that it is not the skills we actually have that determine how we feel, but the ones we think we have. Them. 
this is really interesting that what we think or what we believe is true it's more important than what it actually is so we have this biased perception that is used in bci uh for example bias perception of oneself in vr where they used body ownership illusion or for example in our case we wanted to see uh, what happens if we bias the perception of performance? So we adapted the task difficulty, but without really the uh, participants noticing that we it's adapted. So we actually tried to see whether or not, you know, if we give a negative, positive, or without bi uh, feedback without a bias, but it was still a little bit adapted. So it's not really completely negative, but it's still yet, you know, negative, adaptive, negative, positive. So it was still a little bit adaptive. Um, and um, so, uh, but it was adapted according, sorry, I didn't maybe say it, it was adapted according to the real time performance of the user. So we were always looking at how the user is performing in real time and trying to, you know, not to demotivate them too much or not to make the task too easy with positive advice. We were trying to, you know, keep the flow, the, this state of flow always. And we realized that these benefits of altered perception of performance are subject dependent. So basically depends on personality or state. What does that mean? So for example, if a person is competitive, he would like to have more difficult tasks. So a negative biased feedback. While one who is anxious, no, no type of biased feedback will help them. They will just have no bad performances in BCI and maybe biased feedback is not the way to help them improve their performances. While those who are in flow, who perceive to be in a flow state, they didn't need any type of, of uh, bias, negative or positive. So they, they had best performance without a bias in the third here case, as you see. Or those who performed the most effort or ha had highest, highest mental workload, they would also prefer, for example, a more challenging task and so on. Okay, I got in too much into detail in this. But um, I would also like to maybe pause a bit and just say on a side note that when what happened when we add all of this immersive content, immersive environment, VR and XR, and such a realistic content in, in BCI, we actually didn't realize um, we didn't account for all of these effects of these rich stimuli on brain, brain activity. So there are a lot of studies and there are a lot of experiments using, you know, this guy is using VR with haptic feedback, this guy's only visual audio, and, and no, nobody is really paying attention of, well, what, what actually is this perceptual, you know, the, this, this sensory information, what is it doing to the brain? We can't just use it like that because we want to motivate the user. You know, we, what if, as you saw in the beginning, if we present a manipulable object on the right position, there are so many, you know, details and content display, what, what we display to the person and how would we react in or physiology and, and brain. So I just want to mention that I tried to, maybe there are people who, here in the who are listening to me who are really experts in BCI, maybe this will help them, you know, uh, create more more vigilantly, let's say, next to their, their protocol designs in BCI uh, in, uh, interface designs. You can check maybe the paper. I'm not going to talk about this now. Um, so yeah, going back. So when we uh, use EEG, and in BCI, it's actually difficult to assess emotion. And basically, it, even if we, with VR, we do induce beneficial physiological, psychological states, we can't really, don't really know how to measure them. Now, in all of these previous examples, we were using questionnaires for that, and that's subjective. We don't really know, I mean, it's not really an objective metric. We can't really, you know, it would be best maybe to use more a physiological um, information than just neural information because with neural we can't know uh, we can't get into the emotion can't assess assess the emotion so the future of bci or other neuroadaptive technology you know is to use a new technology that would use not only you know in bci only neural 
information, but also visceral information from the gut, from the heart, uh, respiration, and so on, so that we can adapt the environment and really uh, assess the emotional and cognitive information from the user and be able to adapt the immersive environment and understand what we're doing. So the new technologies, for example, I would like to mention the OpenBCI's uh, Galea uh, tech that actually has, you know, uh, embedded in the VR headset, they have uh, EEG, there is, you know, EMG, now I'm telling you, so we can, we can, I'm not gonna, maybe you don't know the acronyms, but uh, we can basically uh, take a lot of more information, sensory information from the user, uh, from their facial expressions, we can take eye tracking, there is, you know, okay, neural information, sweat, heart rate, and so on. So with one system, we can have everything and we can have an immersive, an immersive, um, an immersive environment in VR. Of course, there is a tech that is uh, also by OpenBCI that I wanted to mention that uh, measures uh, also sweat and different physiological responses, emotibit. And I, I saw that it was really, it would really be interesting. What if we, uh, if we think about an XR for visually impaired, how would that be? Like the person wouldn't need to, to carry this heavy digital eyewear, but basically they would maybe need just headphones to be able to be immersed in the environment, but by only auditory or also haptic or, you know, full body immersed, uh, uh, experience uh, but as we add all of this uh, you know information or all of this feedback take full body audio and everything where is the limit like when when will we I would just like to stop and think about that when, when will we find it enough when will it be enough and where where will we stop you know adding and, and maybe isolating ourselves from our own reality? No. So how far will we go? Yeah. So for just to end my talk, I will end my talk with, with uh, some questions that I would like you to ask yourselves. So are we fully aware of the effects of stimuli on the body and brain? Can we as researchers guide companies and those who, you know, who create these products to provide safe content for user well-being? Can we offer users to choose for themselves what will be displayed to in a way give them the power and to know what kind of content provokes what kind or evokes what kind of physiological response? And as users, you know, we also use this kind of tech. Can we stop using such adaptive or addictive technology? Because if this technology evokes flow, we wouldn't want to stop using it and it, will, it might become addictive. So how can we maybe try to limit or stop ourselves to use such, such a technology? And can we control, for example, who sees our intimate emotional reactions in virtual reality? We sometimes feel that when we're in a virtual reality that we're completely secluded from everyone else, that it's very intimate and it's only what we can see, but actually it's completely the opposite. Everyone, can see what we see. And it actually, like all of the data can go to the cloud on the cloud. All our physiological data can be just shared. And we can we really maybe control and keep this information for ourselves? And also for the last question, but not least, are we isolating ourselves from each other when using such immersive technology and isolating each other, ourselves from nature? and our own reality. Is our reality not you know, enough? Or how can we maybe uh, balance or find a balance between the two? Okay, that's all for me. Uh, that, so I hope that this, uh, these questions will foster discussions and maybe make you think about uh, where, uh, where do we stand or where does this technological advancements lead us? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yelena. We have some few minutes if for a question. Questions, yeah. Or reaction or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> 
too much information, was it? <laughs> ah, thank you. Okay. Hmm. I'm actually wondering, are you? Ah. How these technologies, uh -huh, this is a very interesting question. How will these technologies affect lifespan? That's really interesting. Well, yeah, if we uh, are, you know, constantly in VR, that might not be uh, very healthy for our eyes, for our posture. Um, that, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure. It, it, it might reduce our, I don't know, reduce our lifespan, but definitely it could, it could decrease our, uh, you know, health in a way. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'm not sure. I am trying to think of a positive, uh, <laughs> positive thing to think about with these technologies. I don't know if we can increase our lifespan. Yeah, mostly it's my, my opinion is mostly negative. Yeah, thank you for the question. I would like to know what, what do you think? <laughs> Uh, how can we classify emotions using EEG? Uh, yeah, well, that's what I was talking about earlier. It's a more difficult when you use EEG. Um, classify emotions. Well, it's, I mean, it's now, now you, you're kind of adding a term. When you say classify, it's sometimes mean more like a machine way to classify emotion. Like, do we need a classifier and to, 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 uh, you know, machine learning to be able to classify emotions and so on. But um, I'm not sure with EEG, we can't really assess emotional information. Now, some people have tried and I'm afraid that there are some papers that are not really, maybe they don't have, you know, enough data and maybe they, yeah, that's the problem with EEG and you know neurotechnologies because there are a lot of uh, studies and experiments and people are not really um, very knowledge. Maybe they don't really know a lot, and you know they get some signals and a lot of information, and then they manage to classify something, but they don't really understand what it is. But you, you find something, you're like, oh wow, I can. So. Mm, yeah, I, I actually came across, you know, I'm kind of hesitant to talk about that, but I came across a lot of papers that, you know, said that, yeah, I, I found with only one electrode, I, I managed to measure, I don't know, arousal and balance and things like that. That's really not possible. You need a lot, like, you need a lot of electrodes to do that. And um, to classify motion, well, like in any classification method, you need a lot of data, you know, from a lot of, a lot of uh, participants, a lot of people. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pass. I ha I have all other questions. So yeah, I, I wouldn't say that with EEG. I, I think we will answer that maybe uh, tomorrow with a technical. Maybe to okay okay tomorrow that you'll have the the answer. Um, will we human fall in love with those virtual characters and don't even want to go back to real life one day? Yeah, that that can be a problem uh imagine yeah in the future if uh, you know the graphics are so well developed and we you know we we, we have all this haptic feedback sensory feed, uh, smell chemical feedback temperature and everything you know we could maybe imagine touching a virtual person or character and you know feel maybe more uh confident in another represented in another avatar you know so yeah, it, it you know if your question is well, is it possible? I think you know anything is possible, and where we're going, yeah, it, it, yeah, I think it could be possible. <laughs> um, using or leveraging AI? Okay, I don't know who asked that. Using uh -huh, uh -huh, for the emotions using EEG, using or leveraging AI. No, I, again, I'm not really understanding this question. So um, it's for, uh, to the previous one with the classify emotion using EEG. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, uh, you know, also AI is a very used term often, and it means a lot of things. And 
nothing at the same time like ai is you know sometimes just machine learning means ai or also there are some uh, evolutionary uh, algorithms like genetic algorithm is also called ai and you know there are a lot of algorithms that are used but uh, so you mean aha uh -huh. you mean can we classify emotions aha uh -huh. okay so you basically mean if we take a lot of data from a lot of people and basically you can use maybe deep neural network uh, uh to 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 yeah maybe maybe we could yeah if you have a lot of data with eg i, I think i mean the problem with eg or in emotion is that or with any kind of physiological response is that you need ground truth. So I would advocate that you would need maybe more physiological information. So for example, from the heart, respiration and so on to, in order to, you know, have a better picture of what's going on because only with EEG, you can assume a lot of things and I'm not sure that you will be able to, 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 really, to really determine the right, uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to, to know what, what's actually and really going on, you know? So, I don't know. Uh, are emotions discrete or continuous in nature? What are your opinions about that? Are emotions discrete or continuous? I think it's continuous. I mean, I think everything in nature is continuous. <laughs> Sorry, but I, th I feel that everything that is natural is continuous, yeah. Um, discrete is something that we would describe a machine you know a machine has discrete uh aha uh -huh, but if you hmm, but if you aha uh -huh, if you add the machine to interpret emotional reactions from the person you might yeah but then it converts into something a, a modality this again um uh, again, analog with like sort of feedback, and yeah, I would definitely say it's it's continues. So I'm gonna go to another. I think so too. When do you think it would happen in our next generation? Ah, for the uh -huh. now I have an, uh, uh, another uh, comment on the human falling in love in virtual characters, and the a question is when do you think it would happen in our next generation? Um, next generation maybe huh, i don't know i mean the, the technological advancements are so fast and to me it's even scary it's unpredictable it's happening so fast that i i mean sometimes i'm not even able to follow you know follow up with everything that's going on and everything that is that is being introduced uh, so next generation i think it would be maybe too soon next year i would like to think it's not it, it, it's not as soon, you know, maybe something, something new might be, might happen, like something, maybe a new way of uh, interacting with the world or enhancing the experience or the environment without using, um, you know, digital eyewear or something, maybe, maybe something completely new will just arrive and we will still be in this reality, like in the mixed reality, but something maybe completely new. I don't know. I'm just, you know, a lot of ideas can just, anything can happen. So we um, the I'm trying to, to access, wait, there are five. I'm not sure I can see, uh, wait, how can I see? Are these five questions that I see on, are you seeing my screen? Yeah. So I see uh, Q and A five questions. Or these yes, are yeah, the five all answered. Uh, it's it's fine. Oh, okay, I, I answered. Okay, thank you. I don't know uh, what uh, am I am I uh, taking too much time, or I didn't really look at. The... We are just in time to to finish and to to close this session. So it was a very. Okay. Thank very... you so much, everyone, for all of your questions. By the way, I'm really I'm really thankful that you know I could I could maybe foster some interrogations or discussions between between you and between us. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Romain. Thank you to you. And, and thank you for this very interesting and physio philosophical uh, presentation also. It was very nice. And, um, and I, I see there are also some remarks in the chat like uh, about uh, book recommendation and stuff like that. So do uh -huh. uh, better understanding. Uh -huh. 
better understanding of BCIs. Uh, if you want really a book, like a book with a thousand pages, uh, you can uh, look at, um, I think it's called uh, Theoretical Advancements. Wait, I'm going to check. Let me, let me check. Uh, how do I? Wait. Maybe you can uh, write it in the chat and uh, we will yeah. uh, pass to the round table to, to stay yeah. in time. Like BCA Handbook and Theoretical Advancements and Implications, something like that, by Lot, uh, Nam, and Nyholt, I think. I will, I will find it and uh, write it. Okay. Advancements. Uh, should I stop sharing or? Yes, I will yeah. take the floor from here. Okay. Thank you again, okay. uh, Yelena. Thank you. Thank you. So. Now I will uh, will switch to the round table. So I'm very honored and I'm happy to welcome uh, Christina, Kavia, and Marilor. Or maybe Marilor is not yet here, but uh, we can start with some introduction and presentation. So I propose to these uh, three panelists to uh, to take a few minutes. Uh, to, to present their, their, their self, and then we will have a, a few questions to, to address and to discuss uh, together. Uh, so I don't know, maybe Christina, you want to, to start? Yeah, okay. sure. So the floor sure. is yours. Um, Roma, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, first of all, Huge thank you to Roman for inviting me here today. I'm really happy to join. And thanks also to NeuroTX for hosting this event. I love what NeuroTechX does as well as all of its chapters. So I'm really honored to be here. Um, so a bit about myself. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and experimental psychologist by training. Um, after my PhD and postdoc, I worked clinically for a few years before I started working in industry. And that is with brain products. So um, what are we actually doing at Brain Products? Well, we're manufacturers of hardware and software solutions for neurophysiology researchers. That means EEG basically, so electroencephalography devices, as well as many other associated accessories and other biosensors. So ECG, EMG, EOG, GSR, all of those fancy acronyms that measure extra peripheral physiological signals. Well, we offer our amplifiers that are stationary and lab-based, which we often see used by researchers who are employing classic experimental protocols, as well as amplifiers designed specifically for EEG and fMRI recordings. We also have mobile wireless amplifier, which is perfect for naturalistic settings, for the field of mobile brain body imaging, or for immersive technology. So to go with our amplifiers, we offer electrotypes for every recording scenario based on the participants that you're recording from, as well as the amount of preparation time that you can afford during your EEG setup. Our active gel-based electrodes have the highest signal quality and a relatively easy preparation. I'll talk about their specific utility in the immersive tech field a bit later, where you'll also see some of this equipment uh, being used when I show a few case studies. Um, so now I want to get into the industry versus science aspect, which I think is a really great complement for our niche field in this regard. Um, first of all, a bit of background information about the people at Brain Products, because I think our past history really helps to shape our current perspectives. Most of us have PhDs and some kind of postdoc or research experience, and many of us have been scientists too, so it's really easy for us to get into the shoes of our end users, as we have mostly been in that place before in the lab, doing research, collecting precious data and relying heavily on your equipment to deliver reliable data without any hassle. But now we're in industry and we're not a company that does research. So sure we do R&D and in-house testing but we're not conducting any proper research studies. We like to leave that up to the scientists but it's really the intersection of science and industry that gives us an advantage. It's about knowing scientifically what we can do to inform product development ideas adding new features and generally improving on future iterations in a data-driven in a data-driven approach that is facilitated by our contacts within the scientific community. In addition to our backgrounds, we interact a lot with our customers and end users. Before Corona, this was mostly at conferences, having conversations at the booth about their research activities, as well as visiting posters and talks. Sometimes we'd even do lab visits or one-on-one -on -one interviews for more in-depth user experience research. 
for some of our own brain products, webinars and events, or even our press release articles, we call on experts in a given application to contribute as this adds a lot of richness to the material and gives our audience a real connection to the actual science behind a topic. So with this slide that you're seeing right now, what I want to show is that we try to follow the whole experience from research question all the way to publication. Aside from providing the equipment, we strive to maintain a high level of compatibility with many different kinds of open source software packages, including experimental control and presentation software. We have comprehensive recording and analysis software, and what is often very much cherished by the community is our free scientific and technical support so that researchers can reach out to us at any point along their journey. And even when it comes down to the final publication, we are reading these publications and sharing them on our social media channels, as well as offering grants for publishing in open access journals. So we really try to, um, even though we are an industry, have a connection with the open science community. So in a way, we are really trying to follow the researchers throughout their entire journey from the research question to the publication. So as I said, we have really close contact with scientists and like to follow their studies regardless of the application field. But since we're talking today about biosensing and immersive technology, I wanted to share a few highly relevant studies. Here you can see our EEG electrodes and amplifiers being used in combination with VR. Now, these images are work done on spatial navigation in a VR environment at TU Berlin at the BMO Mobi Lab, um, headed by Professor Klaus Kramann. And this is actually a pretty impressive setup with a high density EEG montage, virtual reality, and freely moving participants. But these studies are not just limited to EEG and AR VR, but also sometimes include motion capture as well as muscular stimulation or a host of other biological sensors from extra peripheral sites. Now, given the complexity of the setup and the possible interference of electromagnetic noise into the EEG signal due to the VR, there are some challenges that researchers may face. And what you saw in the previous slide were these electrodes being used, and these are our active electrodes, which I mentioned earlier, called ActiCap Slim, and they very nicely deal with these challenges, and we recommend them to reduce the impact of the external noise, because the impedance conversion happens in the electrode itself, and thus provides better shielding for the rest of the signal path. In addition, they are a really good companion for this kind of setup because the profile is super slim and sleek. It's only a few millimeters. Therefore, it's very easy and comfortable for the participants when a VR mounted headset is placed on top. So the last few studies I mentioned were highly research driven projects, but there are some projects that go beyond pure research, including therapeutic applications as well. Uh, for, for example, we are involved in a national R&D project funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, and it's about using VR and BCI for the treatment of chronic pain. We're really excited about this project carried out together with academic partners at the University of Würzburg, and I think this is another fine example of where industry and science cross over. Another really interesting thing we see from some of the researchers are artistic projects. So for us with our very neuroscience focused backgrounds, it's actually really refreshing to see these combinations of immersive tech and BCIs branch out into the creative realms. Um, I won't go into too many details about this because we have another expert on the panel. So I'll leave that to her. Now, of course, with all of these projects, regardless of whether they are strictly research aimed at therapeutics or should eventually address a consumer market, all have ethical concerns. Brain Products has been part of the Brain Initiative for at least the first two rounds, and the Brain Initiative tries to make a framework for addressing neuroethics and neuro rights. Although as industry, we may not play a direct role in this, but we can still be part of the conversation and take certain ethical considerations into account in many different aspects of our business proceedings, whether that's product development, R&D, or any corporation projects that we may take on. Um, so with that final note on ethics, I'd like to thank everybody for listening to my intro, and I really look forward to the rest of the roundtable session. Okay, thank you, Christina. Uh, Thanks, Paul. Kavia, you want, you want to, to go next? You need to unmute yourself. That's been the phrase of 2022. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> actually the entire 2020, 2021. So I'm winning the game today. Anyhow, thanks everyone. I'm Kavya Perlman. I'm the founder and CEO of XR Safety Initiative, XRSI. XRSI is a nonprofit. We are a global standard developing organization and our mission is to help build safety and inclusion in XR ecosystems. And now we have a word for it, AKA Metaverse. Um, back in 2019 when we started, we didn't have that word and not, not a marketing hype around it. Um, uh, I was added to this panel very last minute, so I just kind of pulled together in a jiffy a few slides. So let me quickly share that with you. Um, uh, before I begin this, though, back in um, 2016, I was the uh, third party security advisor over at Facebook, now called Meta. Uh, and I can confirm to you, you know, practically from my lived experiences, all these things, something that I've seen progress. And I just want to draw a straight line how technology can impact human beings, human life, society and culture. And then the kind of data that we are now uh, grappling with, uh, with biosensors and XR devices already kind of converging with these brain computer interfaces that can be a concern. So what's something that starts as benevolent as this, um, it progresses into, you know, much more uh, concerning convergence, which we are observing over at XRSI. And of course, you know, with the evolution of metaverse, it's only going to get worse. Uh, just a little bit more about after leaving uh, Facebook in 2016, I also was the head of security for a um, the oldest existing virtual world. Some of you may have heard of Second Life, uh, the creator of Linden Lab. And after that, I started this XR Safety Initiative. We have several programs and, you know, I can sort of touch on the programs that are relevant here. So let me present these slides. Um, so, uh, you know, this is kind of benevolently how data collection started back, you know, when Facebook came into emergence and everyone's like, oh, I like this color, I like this whatever. But then, you know, we have to look to the history, how this kind of a like preferences and everything can inevitably impact society, politics, and lots of different ways, uh, the way we receive insurance and whatnot, uh, the way we uh, conduct our de democratic processes all the way to creating some kind of a massive polarization which we are seeing with, you know, not being able to establish, come to consensus on a singular threat that humanity might be facing, such as COVID-19, for example, regardless of where we stand on that. It is something that we, we should, you know, unify. But this type of uh, data collection can lead to massive polarization and lead to, you know, Brexit and um, all kinds of propaganda and whatnot. And on the left, you see 2011, the, that's where, you know, I was observing this whole landscape change with the when when a 30 year old dictatorship is brought down just with the use of social media there's something remarkable that has happened there uh, so talking about xr extended reality it's an umbrella term uh, we sort of even try to standardize it where we put this umbrella term to extend reality into a different dimension where any kind of a virtual reality augmented mixed reality we are being the full immersion augmented you know sort of overlaying some digital objects on top of your real world environment and mixed reality where you can kind of interact with these things is uh, something we consider extended reality um, with the current uh, you know advances we're looking at all sorts of sensors recording camera tracking bone conduction transducers uh, accelerometer and all these things being available handily readily into these might even become a computer so we might leave these devices at some point and maybe you know we'll keep some of it just like mobile computing uh, did not replace desktop of course these type of devices will slowly be become ubiquitous so what does that mean actually i'm not going to play this video but in 2016 this is alexander nix the former ceo of cambridge analytica who basically this is one of those um, uh, annual summit at one of these Republican parties uh, back in 2016, where he's touting one of the candidates is using his technology and he has at least 5,000 data points on each American. We know fast forward, you know, how those data points materialize and I'm gonna stop that. But with XR devices, and this is a research from Stanford University in 2018-19, uh, imagine if they had 5,000 unique data points on each American with 20 minutes of virtual reality 
uh, you know, uh, activity, you can potentially record about over 2 million unique body recordings. And that's 2018, 19, the advancement suggests that this number is way, way more. So what we're really moving towards in this sort of constant reality capture, where, you know, the eye tracking, the gaze tracking, the pupil dilation, like this is really going to be uh, very, very useful for, you know, advertising and whatnot. So I really become the prize for marketers and whatnot. Not. And how is it going? The, you know, remember the benevolent, I like this, I like that. Now, this is what's really happening is, uh, in fact, you, if you look at Meta, there is a particular research project, research project, <laughs> it's called the Ego 4D. So they are kind of collecting tons and tons of hours of Ego 4D data, egocentric data, which basically tells an artificial intelligence or contextualized, a contextualized AI how humans do things. Well, there's a good side to it in the future, the AI would be able to, or these algorithms will be able to guide us and create and facilitate better experiences, but at the same time, and then these are the good things, but then without the safety, privacy, and all these other consideration, we are really looking at a very double edge, double bind problem, because this could lead to so many unintended consequences. So. Uh, there, why? Because there is all sorts of special data that we have to take into account. At XRSI, we uh, attributed a, like a, a term called biometrically inferred data, which is BID. What that entails is using just your eye gaze, pupil, or your body movement inferences that will be made. These inferences could lead to biases. These inferences could lead to algorithmic algorithms determining decisions about you that that one society to other demographics or whatever, it could lead to lots of problems. I mean, back in, um, you know, fairly recently, some of the data collections and these kinds of attribution inferences have led to genocide in certain demographics. So it's highly concerning if not handled carefully. So what does the future look like? That's another video that I'm not gonna play. Uh, but uh, we should really be, you know, or and this is one statement that I agree with Mark Zuckerberg, we should be teleporting, not transporting, because these technologies could solve the problem of presence, immersion, and a lot of these other health, fitness, working together, that kind of stuff. But of course, it brings new risks, privacy, safety, and identity. And at XRSI, and, uh, you know, we have several programs, CyberXR Coalition being one of them, we're really diving deeper into all these things from a research evidence collection and then just staying ahead proactive with respect to what could this mean what what does this new era of constant reality capture bring mm -hmm. so i'm going to fast forward that video there so are the regulation the answer what are the actual concerns and how do we tackle them and so what what you know i'll close it right here but we recently conducted a data classification roundtable, that being part of it, you know, trying to understand how we can classify the data all the way to EEG, EKG, all these biosensor data to then potentially protect neuro rights. And those type of conversation fold right into the framework. And we're currently planning and this kickoff will happen on March 1st. So if there are any researchers in the room or you know folks that are really keen to explore the intersection of AI, BCI and XR, this would be a great opportunity to look at it from the lens of safety, privacy and ethics. And we kind of map this out to what are the current compliance requirements, but you know, we go granular into, you know, hey, safety bubble, sexual harassment, online safety, like all these things kind of fold under the privacy safety framework. So I encourage everybody, if you're interested in the exploring these intersections, now would be a time to get involved with XRSI. And uh, very simply, you can go to xrsi.org and uh, sign up and, you know, we'll get back in touch with you. And I really appreciate uh, you guys giving me the opportunity to be here today because sometimes all of these technologies are handled in silos. Our goal is to sort of oversee and explore these convergences to then come up with what could be global consideration. Because if we're not careful, people will be left behind. If we're not careful, human rights will be undermined. And especially if we're really not careful with BCI and the kind of data that we're collecting, uh, we will lose our agency, our autonomy, and our right to free will. This is something that we're definitely concerned and able, you know, here to facilitate. So thank you for that. Thank you, Kavya. Marie-Laure, you want to go next? 
Hello, good evening. Uh, so I'm gonna talk from the point of view of the, the artist and uh, to present myself, I'm both an artist and a researcher. Uh, I've been making art science projects since almost 20 years now. And I'm currently a postdoc researcher in the Center of Excellence in Media Innovation and Digital Culture in Tallinn University in Estonia with a European Postdoc um, Mobilities Plus grant. So my point of interest is to create new forms of films prototypes using the US technologies and scientific research. This drove me in the field of interactive cinema. Uh, this picture is for me uh, very uh, evoking this uh, invisibility I want to make uh, uh, visible in the form of cinema uh, uh, I want to create. Um, uh, and to in, in the context of interactive cinema, I've been choosing the work with uh, to work with implicit interaction that seems to me more appropriate with the filmic immersion. This led me to use biosensors and to create my first neural interactive film in 2014, Emotive Cinema, where several spectators wear EEG headsets uh, in order to analyze their emotional state while watching the film. The emotional data interact with the scenario of the film where the different behaviors of the characters deliver different versions of the story. Recently, with, uh, so this is a emotive cinema, maybe you can go next. Um, this, uh, yeah, this is, a, there is now a version in progress. We, we, we want to recreate this emotive cinema, but with a, many interactors we had in the first version we had three interaction interactors uh interactive um the, the interactivity was out of this eeg headsets and we analyzed the emotion and we went to three and now we want to extend to have a, a the tendency of the room uh, in a theater place the tendency of the room changing the the, the scenario of the film. That's what we, we try to do with, uh, now with CREAM, University of, uh, of Bordeaux and Access Festival and Mentalista in Paris with the help of the Nouvelle Aquitaine region. So this is a more, uh, we, you can go next. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the more recent project is uh, Emotive uh, VR. VR. Uh, where I want to transfer this technology uh, we, we, we did for emotive cinema in a VR experience. I realized for that uh, a VR 360 pilot film, Freud's Lost Hypnosis, you can see the picture in, in the slide, where the soundtrack and special effects are changing according to the viewer's emotional state. We are now testing the prototype with biosensors like heart rate, pupillometry, and electrodermal activity uh, with the Interaction Lab in the School of Digital Technology in Tallinn. Uh, but of course, our goal uh, in the second phase is to combine the EEG headset with the, uh, with, with the VR headset, which, which means to keep well, the difficulty is to keep the emotional analysis without the disturbance caused by the head's movements. Uh, for these works, okay, I've, I, I just arrived, so I didn't hear very well what was going on before, but I have the feeling that uh, in, in this uh, event, it would be a very nice place to, to exchange uh, and, to, and maybe to collaborate with other people who are more advanced with this specific uh, combination. So I made it very, very short because you, you told me that it, it, it shouldn't be very, uh, so, so, well, I just made it very short, but uh, I'm open to every question, of course. Yes, thank you, Milo and everyone. So um, to, to continue on the discussion, I propose you to, um, uh, to, to continue on, on a few questions. So, so maybe uh, uh, I, I will try to, 
uh, to compile some some of them. So what do you think are the most relevant use cases for XR biosensors? So the, the, uh, this uh, combination between uh, uh, biosensors, EEG on, on XR technologies, and what do you think are the biggest challenge around all this new technology for the present or on future developments? So, I mean, I could start there, um, especially when you say XR, I'm like, oh yeah, there's a lot of use cases that are emerging yes. as we speak. Um, one of the key use cases that we are, I mean, there are use cases from the perspective of, do you want to do social entertainment or do you want to conduct some kind of a research? So uh, specifically, XRSI is currently conducting a very specific research to create natural authentication protocols. So when you say natural authentication protocols, it's really about you know, taking the same, as I talked about, the biometrically inferred data could be you know, your previously. So what's really happening is we're trying to flip the scenario where previously we have believed that you should authenticate using passwords, something you have or something you know, and then there, there is the second factor, which is the token, something you have, and versus something you are. We're kind of flipping this um, uh, upside down in the immersive technology era or in the next technological um, you know, iteration of the internet in the metaverse, we would definitely utilize something we are as the authenticator. And that mm -hmm. means we could potentially use, you know, uh, the data related to even heartbeat or, you know, eye gaze pose, all kinds of, you know, so we're conducting all these various scenarios to understand, you know, how can a human authenticate and this limits to authentication, but then you could potentially even use it for authorization, which is not scope of our research. And this is a research um, funded by NIST. It's about a million dollar grant that we received together with another organization, uh, Cyberbytes Foundation. So that's just one use case. So there are scientific studies that are being done to understand, okay, what are the implication of then you think about the entire data life cycle. So within our privacy safety framework, for example, is like, how is the data collected? How is the data shared? How is it, you know, because there is a lot of third parties that get involved when we create this massive uh, immersion, we call it XR data. So a lot of XR data is being floating around to create, collect, and, you know, to create these immersive, persistent, and three-dimensional spatial experiences. And that means we have to be concerned what is being done with that data. And so these kinds of use cases are there. And of course, augmented reality, video games, and the, you know, there is coordinated assisted surgeries across different countries. So then there is the patient involved. We have a medical XR advisory council that specifically looks at how the privacy and safety of the data, but mainly just try to enable patient trust in this domain. So those are just you know, a few use cases off the top of my head. I could um, also contribute from my side of things. I would think of two different main use cases from, from my background and, and my area of industry. So first of all, I would say the most relevant use case for XR biosense experience or within the field of mobile brain body imaging. So here are research studies where participants uh, can walk around, they can freely move in, in an entirely artificially constructed virtual setting. This allows the possibility to test a lot more different contexts than a purely naturalistic setting. And it gives researchers the opportunity to put participants into situations that would just otherwise simply be impossible. Um, and I think a lot of really interesting findings have come out of this already, and there's for sure way more to come out, especially with the medical, medically assisted side of things like Kavya just mentioned. Um, but to touch on a few things where I think that these are very relevant cases for pure neuroscientific research um, is that VR combines a high degree of control with ecological validity, and you can combine them with non-invasive technologies like EEG and other biosensors. Um, they provide a lot of new insights into spatial cognition and navigation. So, for example, some of those case studies I was showing during my talk from uh, the group in Teu Berlin, they've actually found out a lot about how we move and our cognition during spatial navigation. Um, there's also some preliminary evidence that suggests we are um, 
can be used in the treatment of phobias. And it's actually a very, very powerful tour tool because it provides a sensory illusion within a highly controlled environment. So it's actually got quite high level of e efficacy. And in addition to that, um, there's also some research on neuro neurorehabilitation after brain injury, as well as for pain reduction. So that would be my, my first use case, all if we just bunch neuroscience into one use case. And then second for me, the other most relevant use case would be in, in education, where we see recently immersive technologies are starting to find their way into schools and classrooms. And I think that this could really make a big impact on education. So it allows access for many people who would otherwise be, un be unable to attend classroom settings. Um, so for whatever reason, based on geography, ableness of the body, mental health, anxiety, time constraints, if someone's able to get access to education who otherwise would not have, why not? Um, and then when I think about an immersive tech application and BCI together, this could be worn as a headset with virtual reality and a very basic, simple EEG that would allow you to derive neurometrics from the brain activity, um, like attention, emotion, focus, cognitive, con cognitive workload, fatigue, and then inform the student or the teacher when a th certain threshold is met. And I think that this could really take off and see, there's where you'd see a momentous shift in education. Um, of course, there are some aspects that you would have to consider, like it would have to be clear what kind of cognitive functions the immersive tech would have for learning, what the relationship would be between the technology and the participants and the instructor. Um, but I think it could be uh, really have an impact on pedagogy pedagogical practice and assessment. So those would be my two main use cases for XR and biosensing. Okay, uh, shall I follow? Um, yes, for me, it's, uh, well, it's about art and, and how uh, the emotional state of the viewer could, could inter interact with, with, the, with the, the work of art and to make visible uh, the perception of the viewer in a way, and that this perception participates to the work of art or the film itself. And I think this is very, actually very difficult. <laughs> uh, uh, what we have tried till now with uh, emotions, emotional analysis uh, with EEG, which is maybe one of the most interesting because it gives the valence value, which is uh, being attracted or being retracted um, when other, other sensors give, uh, biosensors give uh, only arousal, arousal level uh, excitement. So, uh, so that's why EEG might be very interesting. But of course, uh, if you think of uh, emotions in terms of attraction and, and, and uh, and uh, being um, on the contrary, then you you think it's very it's very tiny, you know, it's it's very narrow <laughs> in terms of emotions. But um, to 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 be able to to go into the the, the perception and the, and the experience of the viewer, and to have this implicit because you, you can ask afterwards the viewer what did you think, what did you feel, whatever. Then you can have the the whole complexity maybe of, of, the, of the feeling and of the perception. But to have a first insight with biosensors is really, I mean, it just gave um, a kind of, uh, maybe it's still, it's still very idealistic, but uh, it, it, is, it, is a, it gives a physicality to, to the viewer perception. And, and, you know, of course, this, this relation with the, the, the physicality of the emotions, that it's not separate body and mind. And, and, and this, this is a way to, to, to approach, approach this physicality. So that, that I think it's, we, it's, it's a long, far, it's still very far away in, to, to, to get the emotions of the viewer. But uh, to have this physicality entering the work is already a first step, very interesting step. So and you know, 
one thing that I, I, I think it is to be said, we talked about the various use cases, but your question was also about the concerns. And so when it comes to concerns, and I kind of hinted at that, it really stems from what do we do with the data? So clearly for immersive technologies, you need the data. And this creates something called as the calling rich dilemma. It's a double bind problem. Before we understand the impact of what could go wrong, we have to have the data, we have to have the technology sort of materialized. And but by the time this technology materializes, sometimes you know you see that with AI biases and those type of algorithm, it may already be too late. And this is kind of where is the sweet spot of, you know, not to be a futurist, but to create some kind of evidence based research to potentially proactively put guardrails and understand that, you know, okay, we have to really understand the context in which the data is shared, in which the data is harvested, and in which context are we processing the data. So an example would be, hey, we need the data for an artificial intelligence algorithm to potentially diagnose cancer, and we need to have that data. But a similar type of information, at least in, in, in America, in certain jurisdictions, could lead to problems even to getting denied coverage for pre-existing conditions. So then we have to then, you know, this is how, where regulations have to kind of keep up with this aspect. Otherwise, a lot of the people would be at disadvantage because we were, they were trying to seek, uh, you know, medical uh, health and all this, and it led to something like that. Uh, there is a very recent research um, drown table that XRSI conducted uh, on uh, 10th of December last year. So I'm just gonna put the link in the chat for everyone. Basically, this research is really talking about how we these virtual worlds bring real world challenges we looked at it from medical work and education perspective and the kind of data like for example christina was saying that you know this will revolutionize education but at the same time imagine now there is the power that is in the hands of proctors teachers whose data is it whose avatar are you using when it comes to augmented reality I mean, somebody could be putting all kinds of very weird displays within the university campus. And in America, at least a lot of these universities literally own the road. So like whose responsibility is it to clean out these uh, graffiti and stuff? But then it goes all the way to this biometrically inferred data to try to protect it from a regulatory constitutional perspective. For the first time we saw Chile as the country amending the constitution to facilitate neuro rights. And I'm sure in within this report, we compel more and more governments to get involved and just make their positioning statement because they got to protect their vulnerables, their children, the older people, people who have disabilities and create accessibility on one side. Of course, it will provide access. But on, it, on the other side, we know several of the citizens all over the globe still don't have the internet. So if we are not, if we're not careful, people will be left behind so that digital divide could really grow farther and those are some of the you know risks and concerns that come along with these immersive technology and the pci conversions i'd like to just add to that point because i think that you made a, an excellent statement there is that some people may not have access to for example internet and i think that this we have to consider that when we're talking about immersive tech and bcis or biosensing in general there's, of course, the, you know, the, the neuroethics and the neural rights like privacy, consent, agency and identity, restoration to enhancement, as well as bias. But um, I think we're also going to have a big challenge in communicating what a BCI with immersive tech is and is not capable of. So we are going to have to kind of find a common language to be able to explain these kinds of things to people who might really not have any idea if these devices and XR experiences are something which every person may have access to, we have to be able to accurately and clearly describe the whole process from the hardware, the algorithms, what's going on and what these people should expect and what we have to do with this and craft these messages and communicate them with people who may not have the same technical language as us. And I think that this is in fact an ethical issue as much as it is a marketing and communication strategy because the wrong messaging or even slightly misguided messaging could have a really serious consequences and impact.
Yeah, Christina, I agree. You see me nodding there totally with you, you know, this yeah. awareness and education. But that's why, you know, some of our focus areas are literally like, you know, starting with education and awareness, diversity and inclusion, children's yeah. safety, like all of these are very carefully crafted strategic areas that we are really trying globally to convince people. And while exploring the convergence and not just, you know, BCI, but like DLT, decentralized ledger technologies currently you saw i don't know if people noticed there was an open sea hack so like you know cybersecurity being a huge element i myself have a master's in cybersecurity and that's my background so this brings up a lot of you know just like a pre conception of the tech concerns education awareness and stuff but like post conception is also like you know how are we going to secure this how are we going to find the source of truth with respect to forensics and whatnot so thank you for having me i do have to rush <laughs> i i have another appearance uh, at al jazeera you are welcome to join me there but <laughs> i certainly appreciate you guys having me for this brief duration of time it's always lovely to sit with global research community that's where my heart is um i love to explore and i'm always curious and love to learn. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kavya. Bye bye. So so maybe maybe to to continue on on the, on the discussion. So we we have some. So you are like kind of representation of um, of the industry with like uh, Christina. You talk about uh, the the health care uh, education and and so on. And Margaret, you are more like on the on the artistic side, on the research, and on, on also how to connect with the actual uh, final user also. So you are both on these two approaches we, we, we can be combined in a way together. And what do you think you can uh, maybe uh, regarding all the, the issue on, on the regulation aspect, on, on all the thing raising by, uh, by Kavya also, or, or, do, or you, do you see this what we could do to improve all of that and, and what we could be our role as a community like in our techniques to, to help to, to do that? Well, I think when, when it comes to the ethics, well, we really have to be proactive about these issues. I think we should probably have a lot more interactions that involve people of all different kinds of backgrounds. So whether it's cybersecurity, neuroscience, arts and aesthetics, rehabilitation, um, we should gather people with as much diversity as possible. And I don't also mean from the backgrounds, but also from every aspect of diversity inclusion so that we can be in inclusive in not only the frameworks for the ethics, but also the communication strategies about what these products and experiences can actually offer or what they do. And I honestly think something like an ethics review board could even be put in place for this until a unified framework has been adopted and approved. Um, Industry could indeed be involved in the discussions here and think about these issues already at the early phases of product development. And I think by having a groundwork laid out for neuroethics and neuro rights, it doesn't necessarily mean putting up roadblocks to stall or derail neurotechnological progress. In fact, if there is a good ethics um, put in place, if a framework is already in place, this can actually accelerate development by anticipating future problems and addressing them early enough so that innovation can occur with fewer bumps along the road. So I think if we're all mindful of the ethics, this can improve how scientists design their research studies, how developers create their neurotech, and how researchers collect and use their data. Uh, well, I, I think it's... Uh... It's, it's always a kind of, uh, well, uh, as an artist and to meet with, uh, with this uh, technological field and this uh, research, uh, uh, researchers and this, um, uh, there, there are different aims, you know, some people want to, to create uh, new possibilities to be efficient and other like me try to, to reflect about how it, it changes our perception and how it can also make evolution, makes evolution in arts. So, and what also art tells you about ourselves and uh, our reaction, your, our emotional reactions and your, our, our own physiology. So that's very interesting items. Um, I'm, I'm focused on and, and I have to deal with very different approaches. And I think this is the richness of this kind of uh, 
uh, of meetings and events that we can uh, try to to understand each other and 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 not be not be uh, naive or not be uh, you know being aware of 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 the differences also where uh, on the ethical and and a point of view and uh, what you really want for people and you know th this this makes this help this kind of meetings help to be to to make distinction i think for for each of us um that's what i think yeah maybe uh a little uh, thought on that also. So uh, I think the, the research on all the excitement around all these technologies, like all technologies before, it's all about the, the subtlety of finding the, the right compromise with the right framework, uh, how to, to properly regulate and have the ethical uh, uh, committee and so on in science, uh, the ethical approval for a company and so on. On giving the right, the free reign of a certain form of creativity, and and we know some random discovery to to help also to to find new approaches. So, what do you think about that? How to 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 find this type of subtlety, or maybe to with like pluridisciplinarity, or or cross the discipline or the the type of industry on on stakeholders. I think this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before that it's it's having people from diverse backgrounds and people with different perspectives, different opinions, different different thoughts all contribute to the richness of the discussion. So it's really like it it may seem in fact even from an outside perspective counterproductive to put a neuroscientist and an artist and maybe an ethicist and somebody else in a room together but I Think that this is in fact where the most valuable discussions come up because you can educate others on what you know from yourself and your experiences and your studies or whatever as well as learn from theirs and I think that there's it's always this feed forward feedback loop you can always get something out of it and I think that these are the kind of discussions that like really feed into innovation in and especially if we're having this lens of ethics before it, that it's in fact like all of this diversity and inclusion that will really help to foster the, the hybridization and growth of the field in a way that we feel comfortable with. Uh, there is one point also that, uh, well, I've noticed very, very often that uh, between scientists and, uh, and maybe startups or, or you know, uh, people that are uh, making making prototypes uh, for the industry, they they uh, very often they they pretend they can do a lot of things, and and then you you talk with the scientist and he tell, tells you that this is absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm. So I think these meetings can help for like for the point of view of the artist, you know, just just to clarify what is possible, what is not possible and what to do with the possibilities and what to do with the impossibilities. Um, Maybe you can also comment on your future development and what uh, regarding all, all our discussion, what could be like your next challenges uh, regarding XR biosenses? Well, I, I have a, a project, but I, I still don't know where, when it's possible, but uh, that would be the continuation of the Freud's project, um, which would be about the invention of moral. That's why I used the picture at the beginning of, the, of, the, of my talk, um, which would be, I, I would like to know, but th this is still not very, very clear. And I, I'm, I'm going to scientists and people to know if it's possible to 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 detect uh, the the imaginary imaginary uh, the, the 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 part of the of the head where the images are are, are produced 
images from from the mind are produced uh, that that Freud's called uh, regredient regredient uh, images. It's not images perceived, but images that are uh, out of memory and, and imagination. And I think if I could detect uh, this activity of the of the brains, then I would like to to make a project that uh, produces. Uh, in, in a VR experience that produce some um, some uh, some images, some scenarios, like in the moral uh, invention. I don't know if people have read this book, but uh, it's uh, there is a, a, a someone who is in an island and uh, see projection, see people uh, coming and going in the landscape, and indeed there are only projections, and we. We, there is a kind of ambiguity whether it's projection of his own mind because he's hallucinating or because there is a machinery uh, projecting people in the landscape. And, and I think uh, if, if we, we go to the subject that the image, of course, we will not be able to, to, to well, it, or maybe in a very, very long time to see in a, on the screen what are the images that the people are have in their mind, that would be really incredible. But, uh, uh, but to provoke uh, specific images when we know that there is an activity in the brain that I would be very excited to, to work on. And um, from, from my point of view, it's mostly about the, the hardware, right? Because I'm from a company that manufactures hardware and uh, we're also having some software for analyzing and recording the data. But the very, very practical aspect about this is having the hardware to be streamlined. So to have it as condensed as possible while still providing a high level of, of quality and then keeping all of this in an affordable range. So these are some very practical concerns. Um, for example, some consumer, wear consumer wearables are barely measuring EEG, but rather a derivative of it, like EOG or EMG, or they're only measuring EEG in a very imprecise way with a poor signal, but it's actually okay for the algorithms being employed. So these are all the kinds of checks and balances that need to be considered when you think of the entire ecosystem of XR and biosensing. So the application, like what is it doing? the users, um, who is it for, as well as the hardware and the software, and especially the algorithms that are being used. So um, I also think too that the hardware must be robust and durable to have a certain lifetime because if products have a super short product lifetime, people are consistently buying these projects and products and this also has a really big environmental burden. We have a question in the audience. What are the applications that allow more noises and what are those that require more expensive EEGs? Um, so for applications that would allow you to have more noise could be ones, for example, um, like if it's more arousal based. So for example, like if you just want to make sure that somebody is not moving their eyes, well, this could allow for a lot more noise in actual EEG electrodes because probably what you're mostly picking up from frontal or prefrontal electrodes would be EOG activity. And for example, something that would require a more research grade EEG with a more reliable and precise signal and some uh, very precise timing measurements would be the ones that Marie was talking about. So when you want really want to record and perform a very, a very complex analysis, whether you're looking at time frequency or wavelets or even a source localization, you would really need a higher sampling rate, um, less noise in your data, as well as a more densely populated montage. Okay, so if there are no other questions, maybe you would like to share a close on closing statement. Yeah, uh, mostly just a huge thank you to you, Homa and Neurotech X for having me here today. And um, I mean, it was really an honor to be here. I love what Neurotech X does, I always have. Um, and it was really fun. So I invite all of you to check out Brain Products 
um, web page, check out our products, but also don't forget to check out our free events. We have academic events as well as workshops and webinars that we host on a regular basis. So there might be some other kind of online event that is interesting for other participants here. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much, Roma, for, for this uh, event. And I'm very curious to, to, to follow what's happening uh, tomorrow, too. And I hope you, you're you going to make this, um, this event uh, coming back uh, in, uh, in a kind of uh, quite uh, often. So, and I'm really, really sorry I couldn't hear Christina's presentation. <laughs> seems really highly interesting so well uh, i i'm i'm very glad to 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 follow on to to know more about the state of the art uh, in this uh, in this uh, exchange thank you thank you thank you to both of you and uh, thank you for all the attendees also uh, so just as a reminder on the to to kind of close this first part of the the day so I will just recap on the on the schedule we have today. So just after we will have in one hour, actually, we will have a, um, a French session. So with uh, with two guests on, on myself also to, to present uh, content from designer point of view and also an artist cyberpunk point of view and with a little chat uh, all together. And then tomorrow we'll host uh, three technical lectures. Uh, so with uh, five different people, uh, and then we'll finish this uh, uh, XR Biosense initiative with uh, a neurobar discussion. And uh, so it's just, on my point of view, the beginning of, uh, of uh, a new launch, a new energy on, on the umbrella of uh, Neurotechics uh, Network. And we'll try to explore how to make some working group or try to have some performances with some artists and to try to test some, some new material and to, to open the discussion also to the public. So that's, uh, that's the first launch and to, to see how people will react to that and what are the interests. So um, we will try to do some experiment also some open source based uh, a platform like Mozilla Hub, maybe tomorrow uh, during the Neuroba. And uh, we also try to open to partner on sponsorship. So currently we are discussing with uh, OpenBCI on, on cognition. And uh, we are very happy to welcome any discussion on, on, this, uh, on this topic. And uh, feel free to, to stay tuned on, on the event, on our TechX activity, on all our guests and panelists' uh, uh, amazing works, and uh, on our newsletter and so on. And uh, I'm very glad to, to finish on that and uh, to have a very good day or evening or or morning, everyone, and thanks again to Marie-Laure, Christina, and Kavia, and uh, Yelena just before. And uh, yes, yeah, see you, see you next time or just after in one hour. Thank you. Bye bye.